Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen and I'm the Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. The Kupferberg Holocaust Center in Bayside, New York is situated on the traditional land of the Mantinecock people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the people of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is what we call a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, were first inhabited by another group of people who were forcibly expelled and murdered. Today, we identify those crimes for what they are mass atrocities and genocide. These horrors continue to have devastating political, social, psychological, economic, and environmental impacts upon and within Native American and indigenous communities. We're excited about today's event entitled Pedagogical Approaches to the KHC's Concentration Camp Exhibit and features Dr. Carrie Lane, Associate Professor at QCC in the English Department and the KHC's longtime curator in residence. Dr. Lane will highlight ways instructors and docents can incorporate content and themes from the KHC's newest original exhibition, The Concentration Camps Inside the Nazi System of Incarceration and Genocide. This professional development workshop is part of the 2022-23 KHC and National Endowment for the Humanities Colloquium entitled Trauma, Remembrance, and Compassion and is co-sponsored by the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, CETL, at QCC. Today's event is hosted in a Zoom meeting format, as you can see, so you'll be able to interact with Dr. Lane, and please be sure to post your questions via the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Now to kick things off, please join me in welcoming one of this year's KHC NEH faculty fellows, Dr. Ilsa Schreinemakers. Dr. Schreinemakers is an associate professor in the English department at QCC, where she serves as deputy chair and primarily teaches first year composition courses. Dr. Schreinemakers. Thank you, Laura. So thank you for joining us today. What I know will be an engaging and inspiring look into the ways to integrate the current exhibit into our teaching. Um, and now to introduce you to Dr. Lane. Carrie Lane is an associate professor of English at Queensborough Community College um, of the City University of New York. And he has curated four exhibits at QCC's Harriet and Kenneth Kupperberg Holocaust Center as curator in residence. In 2015, Dr. Lane was project investigator for a National Endowment for the Humanities Grant that used the KHC for a large scale pedagogy project about which he published a chapter on arts-based approaches to Holocaust studies in the edited volume, Humanistic Pedagogy Across the Disciplines, Approaches to Mass Atrocity Education in the Community College Context. Dr. Lane has also published extensively on the topics of student-centered high impact teaching practices and learning outcomes of neurodiverse college students. Is also presented about American approaches to Holocaust education at the Krakow Jewish Museum, Auschwitz Birkenau State Museum, and the Rutgers Bildner Center for the Study of Jewish Life. His article, co authored with Dr. Laura Cohen, Diversity, Digital Programming, and the Small Holocaust Center Examining Paths and Obstacles to Visitor Experience, is forthcoming from Ledge Press. The floor is yours, Dr. Lane. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Dr. Cohen and Dr. Schoenemachers, uh, and, and once again, it's a pleasure to be here and, um, and um, discuss uh, really what's been the center of my teaching uh, since I've been at CUNY, or since I've been at QCC the last 12 years, which is using the, the KHC in my teaching um, and sharing ways that others can use the KHC in their teaching. So um, this today's event is gonna be interactive and we're gonna brainstorm ways uh, in which we, you can use uh, the KHC's newest exhibit in your teaching. And, um, and we'll discuss and we'll get down to the nitty gritty about how you can do that. Uh, before we do that, um, I'm gonna take you through the curation process and through the exhibit itself, some of the teaching resources we have and other, re other resources outside the KHC that uh, you can use in your uh, pedagogy. Um, and then show you some actual examples of student work um, that have been based off of uh, the current exhibit. So uh, after that, uh, 
we'll have a, a true forum, a meeting where uh, we can brainstorm and you can chime in and uh, we can give each other feedback in terms of uh, what we think might be effective teaching using this exhibit. So I'm gonna, I have a PowerPoint. The PowerPoint will last about 40 minutes. Again, I'll show a quick video, um, uh, 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll spend the last half hour in discussion. So you don't have to just take my word for it. Uh, the American Association of Genocide Scholars understands the importance of Holocaust education centers in um, quality teaching and making connections for um, those who visit uh, these sites. Um, so as I show here, um, they understand that how powerful and how important the KHC and its content is in terms of affecting individuals, motivating awareness, uh, facilitating contemplation, reflection, making connections to the past, to what's happening now. Um, so it's, it's, this has always been um, inspiring for me in terms of my curation efforts to, um, to think about ways in which we can connect our students to this very important and complex history. And it's nice having allies such as um, this association and, and that really gives a green light for the things we do at the KHC. More than anything else, I think this exhibit is a teaching tool. And so when thinking about ways we can engage students, I really can, you know, and the team, really looked at this as um, a pedagogical tool. Okay, so let's look at the first, let's look at the exhibit's physical space and the curation process uh, to get warmed up about how we can use the exhibit in our teaching. And again, with the emphasis on making connections, um, this is a really complex overview of the, of the concentration camp system. There were, um, Historical accuracy, of course, was of paramount importance, and we aligned ourselves with really top scholars, oops, with top scholars in the field um, who co-wrote the text for the exhibit, who fact-checked what we had, who uh, took a look at the um, aesthetic, and, um, uh, and we're, we were able to work side by side uh, uh, with the uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Nicholas Voxman, who I'll talk about later, as well as prominent um, scholars on this subject. There really is um, something for everybody, no matter what your level of understanding of, the, of this vast concentration camp system, uh, there's, there's, I think, the, maybe the best part of this exhibit is that it appeals to uh, people who really have no idea um, how complex and vast and sinister the concentration camp system was. But it also appears it appeals to those with actually uh, uh, stark knowledge of of the concentrate concentration camp system, and they're, we're finding that they're actually learning um, from what we put forward and uh, the level of detail as well as the our ability to give an overview at the same time. I think is maybe the best part of this exhibit. But if you notice at the bottom, uh, there we we don't want our visitors to walk out the back. Uh, without having a chance to reflect. Um, and so we'll get into that as well. So again, we, we're, we're interested in making connections and inspiring and connecting with our visitors, especially our students. You know, when you begin an exhibit, you have to sort of take a look at the space you have first. And here's the sort of naked um, hallway, the corridor of the uh, Coverbrook Holocaust Center. Um, I've always found it challenging to curate the space because the main corridor where our exhibits are, are is very narrow and um, almost claustrophobic. Um, and that it was designed as such. And this particular exhibit about incarceration and Nazi, the Nazi camps, uh, this actually worked in our favor this go around because that narrow hallway does give the sense for visitors of the center, that sense of confinement, the sense of incarceration, um, and it was from there, it was really a matter of what tools and what aesthetic we can use on these bare walls um, in order to make the most impact. 
the strategy was thus to use multimodal approach to use materials video text film colors um and in and, and maps and infographics to work in concert in synchronicity to create an overall aesthetic and impact where you're what you're walking through the exhibit and you don't quite know what's happening but you feel something you feel a sense of of that incarceration that I was referring to, you feel like the information is actually um, hitting you not only in your head but in your heart. So, one of the one of the main strategies was to go floor to ceiling, to to be overwhelmed by the the, the content here and by the history, including this twenty foot wide and eight foot high map uh, to show you the extent of Nazi control in nineteen in in uh, during World War II. Um, and the sheer number of camps. Um, uh, not many people know that there were 44,000 approximately ghettos and camps uh, during World War II, uh, Nazi camps, uh, that is. Um, and this map, uh, if it's standing in front of it, um, it drives that home with power. And not, the, not just that, but to show how these camps work with one another in terms of the, how the Nazis use them to transport their victims. So, floor to ceiling big, stark, um, and powerful. Another strategy was to use actual materials from the camps. During the research phase of this exhibit, it became clear that they were repeating uh, in all the images, there were really four elements, um, physical elements that kept showing up in historical photographs, brick, cinder, iron, and wood. And so in the exhibit gallery, it, it is festooned with cinder, brick, iron, and wood, which I think that physical aspect uh, that really helps a visitor connect with the content becomes very, very important. So again, we, want, we need a mixture of image, text, video, physical materials, uh, film, working in concert, not overwhelming the visitors, but creating impact. It took a large construction team. This happened during COVID. There were supply chain issues. There were transportation issues. Um, we had um, the materials shipped from St. Louis. We had materials that were originally from Europe, uh, Belgian cobblestone to be specific, which we were which are here in, in this section of the exhibit. Creating a dimensionality to this image. Now you might look at this very large image, it's extremely powerful on its own. Again, it's eight, eight and a half feet high, but what happens if we frame it in the materials that these prisoners in, the, in this labor camp uh, were toiling with to try and make that impact with our visitors? And to me, this really sort of is a perfect image of what, we, what we're trying to do here, where we, where we mix physical materials with text and image in one shot. And so you're there. And so if you're, and, and our students are very diverse learners, you know, some are visual learners, some are more text-based learners, some uh, have physical intelligences. This really appeals to our diverse learning styles of our students. Um, and it's just straight up impactful. It brings the toil and the torture and the physical labor to life. I was able to find a, a purveyor of historical bricks in St. Louis. Um, I worked with them to find bricks of the era and of the shape and of the color um, to recreate the pattern and historical impact of the, um, and these bricks are, are more than 100 years old. Uh, they are from a warehouse in St. Louis, but the idea was to recreate the Warsaw Ghetto Wall physically on the walls of the KHC. So they, they, I sent them pictures of the Warsaw Ghetto Wall, and it has a certain pattern where those the skinnier uh, bricks are every third layer. And they were actually, they, were, they got very excited about this project and they, and they recreated, uh, they found the bricks in the same size and shape and mortar, and they were able to send us 
uh, a truck overnight with six pallets, uh, I think 12 tons of these historical bricks um, uh, during the mounting of this exhibit. And our construction team also, this became sort of a, um, you know, there was pride involved. And um, there was like, it, be, it became personal for everybody who was working with the student interns and the construction team and myself um, and Laura and, um, and Marissa, we, we really, um, it became very important for us to sort of do this properly. And even choosing the, the mortar that would, of the same color and tone of that in, in the ghettos. Um, Our graphic designer, Robin Schwartz there and Alexia Wang, one of our wonderful student interns, um, everybody pitched in. And, um, you know, we framed these pictures in brick. We framed them in, uh, in cinder. We framed them in wood. We chose col color palette that um, was reminiscent of mud or, um, you know, not bright, you know, so um, every, Every aesthetic choice had a historical basis. I wanted to I wanted to create a threshold in the front and back of the exhibit so that when visitors came, that they were entering a different universe, a, 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 a space of incarceration, of captivity, of injustice. Um, so the concept was to actually hire an iron forger to create a very generic um, but Im important symbolic gate at the front and back of the exhibit. So to really um, advance that connection I, I referred to, it, it, you can't help but change when you actually walk under this eight and a half foot gate. Um, and um, once again, this, um, um, this iron forger based in Queens, a local business, um, he really took to the project and um, really gave it his all. And I just think this is one of my favorite parts of the exhibit, the way it just, and it's, we made it look sort of, we wore it down. Uh, you know, this is sort of, the steel was used, uh, was new, but we made it look worn. And there's actually, some of the bolts are actually vintage as well, but we just wanted that generic feel that, that when students and visitors come under this threshold, this gate, this iron gate, and it's, and it's solid, and it's loud if you knock on it, and and it just feels ominous, um, and it even feels ominous. So we didn't want to recreate the Arbic Mach Fry, or you know, it was very very careful to make it just a generic symbolic threshold, but that black iron, and um, it just creates a very powerful impact. Okay, and it's solid, as you can see, he's hanging off of that thing, and those are welded uh, to the um, to both sides of the wall. We go floor to ceiling in this exhibit the whole way. Here the, here's one of those pallets of bricks I was talking about. Uh, the idea of framing um, framing our sort of huge enlargements and our text. If you notice there, the text board goes floor to ceiling with miniature uh, images as well. You know, that sense of just uh, immensity, you know, the immense size of this uh, incarceration system. There's something about these vintage bricks that just transports you back in time. And this is the more finished look at the end. We're just doing little touch-ups here, throwing a light there on the iron. You can see in the corner, um, how distressed that iron looks. And uh, the last piece was um, wood, um, wood of um, the barracks in um, most concentration camps, um, wood in the transportation cattle cars. Um, it was, again, this, this happened all during COVID and uh, um, Maybe the vaccines had just come out, uh, 
um, it was dicey. It was hard. Uh, we were all very dedicated. We were all masked the entire time. Finding wood that's 80 to 100 years old was not an easy task during COVID. There, there, were, there was a, um, up in uh, Saratoga, up in the Adirondacks, there was a um, vintage wood purveyor who would, um, you know, anytime there was an old barn closing, he would, uh, he would grab wood from it and he, end, he ends up selling these vintage woods. The, what you're looking at here is from a mushroom farm uh, in Brandywine Valley, Pennsylvania. These were mushroom growth, uh, these were mushroom uh, farms. And so that moisture over the 80 years of this mushroom farm in Brandywine Valley, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, the mushroom capital of America, um, really created that distressed look. And because these are period wood and they do look almost identical to the barracks and the pictures of the barracks. So framing our images, um, floor to ceiling with this vintage wood was really just, a, a, just I thought, a beautiful touch. Uh, putting the wood on either side of the map, for instance. And uh, again, those, those, the, that, um, um, that old vintage wood shop up in the Adirondacks, they drove these down. There was really no other way to transport them. They drove the four hours and they, and they brought them down. And just everybody just pitched in. And once they knew what was happening in terms of what this project was, there was a huge buy-in from all of our vendors. Again, another example of materials with text and image and video, um, sort of uh, the composition of which is does not overwhelm you, but at the same time communicates, inf communicates information in um, multiple modalities to appeal to our diverse learners. And keep in mind, we had to go through thousands of images to and sort thousands of images. We had a a Google spreadsheet uh, that uh, I was working with our, uh, mostly with our interns um, and our historians who we consulted with for this to ensure historical accuracy, but choosing the premium pictures that fit our text, which fit the videos um, uh, and fit the materials was um, really important. In fact, you could see even in that image underneath the video screen, uh, prisoners being lined up by Nazis against a wooden fence that looks like the wood we have in the gallery. So most often we would, for smaller sections, we would hang the text boards over the materials, which I think creates a nice dimensional effect. There's a few of our student interns working with um, uh, actual artifacts, which are in this exhibit as well. And um, ensuring that these artifacts are well protected and um, mounted in a respectful way. One, of, one aspect of this exhibit is to uh, show the breadth of the, the types of victims uh, that were uh, um, in the Nazi concentration camp system. So an infographic, which is near the map in this case, uh, just shows uh, um, how many different types of victims there were uh, that the Nazis um, victimized. And, you know, we teach in the Coverbrook Holocaust Center's on one of the most diverse campuses in the United States, if not the most diverse, you know, we're in the county of Queens. Um, something like this, seemingly small, but so important for students to sort of help them identify, um, uh, to see that range of victims, uh, the, the breadth of brutality is really helpful for our students to help make that connection we talked about earlier. And if you see Muslims at the bottom, there are 2,000 Muslim victims by, at the hands of Nazis. We put infographics in, in, um, in different ways where we actually went by camp and by group. 
So that one was the, the previous one was by group. This one was by camp. Uh, who were the victims in which camps? Um, uh, to show that information in in um, in a way that would appeal to visual learners. And the different types of camps that were, um, I think, uh, um, you know, at least three quarters of the camps were forced labor camps. Um, but, you know, again, we were talking like even those with advanced knowledge of the concentration camp system might be surprised by um, how many forced labor camps there were compared to exterminate major extermination camps or um, the fact that there were uh, at least 500 camps dedicated to sexual terror. Um, so infographics like this, I think, help drive home the scale and scope. And when you put that next to the map, which itself is of a scale and scope um, together, uh, it creates a very, very powerful way of absorbing this very delicate and um, sensitive information. You also got very personal towards the end of the exhibit. Um, and you might, this might seem familiar to you because uh, the Auschwitz Memorial Museum uh, sends out a, a tweet every day with highlighting a victim. And so we wanted to get personal too and just not look at this in the broadest scope, but actually get down to the victim level. Who are, the, who are their victims? And so we have a slide, um, a, a 40 foot wide triptych of revolving slides of images, extra images and captions um, that aren't that um, supplement the exhibit, but also every third slide is um, a profile of one of the Nazi victims. To you know, make this personal for students and not just see this uh, in the abstract or as sort of historical, um, you know, to, to make it personal, and um, I think it's very effective. And lastly. Uh, you know, the Kupperberg Holocaust Center is lucky to have so many survivors who are still with us who are willing to help uh, edu educate the public. And we were able to interview two weeks before, two weeks before uh, COVID shutdown. Okay, so we, in the classroom in the KHC, we turned it into a film studio, literally February of 2020. Um, and we interviewed, 13 local Holocaust survivors about their experience uh, being incarcerated by the Nazis. Um, and this also dry, is extremely personal and sort of being in the room and conducting these interviews for me and for everybody who was in that room was just ex extraordinarily powerful. Um, and to be able to include the word from the survivors themselves Amongst the materials I just showed you, amongst the sort of historically accurate text, amongst the maps and the infographics, to have these voices from those who actually experienced it to sort of contextualize these aesthetic choices, which are fine, but like to contextualize those aesthetic choices with, with the actual victims um, who are affiliated with the Kupferberg Holocaust Center was, um, to me, the best part. So we have three videos um, throughout the exhibit and um, uh, pre-war, during the war and post-war. That's how we, we sort of chronologically broke it down. And, and generally speaking, the, the exhibit goes in, in chronological order, pre-war um, and then during the war and, and then uh, liberation and reflection. Here is the reflection wall I mentioned earlier, which is really been uh, something consistent in the four exhibits that I've curated to really have an opportunity for our visitors to process what they just experienced and to chime in and to respond to one another. Um, we did this for Conspiracy of Goodness exhibit, um, um, which is about two or three exhibits ago. Um, and we have reflection prompts, and we have blue cards, which are also symbolic, um, that students can put in these, um, again, these chicken wire baskets, which, again, reminiscent of the camps. Um, but um, coming up with 15 or 18 questions that could, again, cover different bases about what students might be thinking or experiencing 
questions that will help them make connections to their own lives and their own experiences with immigration or discrimination or poverty or racism and the ability for them to respond to one another as well um, makes this reflection area, I think, very, very important. And that's me like done with the exhibit. That's as, as satisfied as I can look at least, but uh, um, a true relief to get this done during um, COVID and knowing full well that this exhibit would, would be used as a teaching tool for years. Um, and it wasn't just me, it was the students who worked with me, um, the entire KHC staff, the survivors and all the construction crew and our, and our graphic designer, uh, Robin Schwartz, um, and the historians we worked with. Uh, this was a labor of love and um, I think it showed. Um, there's, um, there is, uh, there are several, that's the physical space. There is a, there are digital resources as well um, on the KHC's website and links from the KHC's web website to several resources. And I'll get into those a little bit later, but we have a very important library and study guide for students, um, which takes them not only through the exhibit, all the text and images and videos from the exhibit are in that libguide, but uh, as well as re research uh, help for students across the disciplines. Uh, vocabulary um, links to sort of absorb some of the massive amounts of vocabulary that there are uh, in this exhibit to help them digest. Um, uh, librarians who are working with us and that could help students and in your classes um, who are familiar with the exhibit, who built, built this LibGuide are available to work with you. Um, of course, we have the images and text and captions and the PDF of the exhibit catalog and a slew of support links to um, other um, internet sites and historical resources about the camp system and um, World War II. And of course, archive of events like this. Okay, so that's the physical space and some of our digital resources about that from this exhibit. Let's pivot for a minute to talk about ways to actually use this exhibit in your teaching. And there hasn't been a semester, and I've been at QCC for 12 years, there hasn't been a semester where I haven't used the KHC in my teaching. I need it because it makes my job more interesting, let alone it helps the students. Um, it, it makes the class sort of much more dynamic. First of all, the exhibit is a perfect match for any of the 10 hips that you're doing. High impact teaching practices, okay? George Q and the <clears throat> American Associates of Colleges and Universities. Um, there is a, one of these 10 high impact teaching practices that wouldn't fit perfectly well um, uh, by using this exhibit or the KHC. Um, the common read being the common intellectual experience, you know, a, a capstone project, a collaborative assignment, a certainly diversity in global learning, uh, e-portfolios, perfect first year experiences, a lot of English one-on-one -on -one students come in to, uh, to the center and use the center learning communities, um, internships, service learning, community-based learning, undergraduate research, writing intensive. The KHC does all of these things. And with CETL, who is also a, a partner in this, um, and the NEH program, it's a, it's really a, it's a perfect storm of excellent teaching. Um, and as I said at the very beginning, this exhibit is a teaching tool and it fits just about any, and certainly any of these hips, but really anything that you wanna do in terms of uh, coming up with a theme, and I'll talk about that. Um, trauma, remembrance, and compassion is this year's NEH theme. Um, perfect themes to explore the exhibit. Um, I did a I did a um, event maybe five years ago um, uh, surrounding the jacket exhibit about trauma and recovery. Um, Judith Herman, who's a real ex expert on this, so she's out of Harvard, a psychiatrist. Um, it really, this book, and I highly recommend it to you. Um, uh, you just, you know, the idea that telling the truth and creating an, an, a truthful impact here uh, are prerequisites for the restoration of social order as well as for healing of individual victims. That that recovery can take place after trauma, and uh, we need truth and reflection to get there. 
here's some th some th some sub themes that um, and again I say it's a partial list because there 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 would be a slew of others, but if you're reading something in your class that sort of touches on one of these, the exhibit would be a perfect fit. And certainly, um, uh, not to mention the common read, but uh, um, it would you'd be hard pressed to find something you're reading in your courses that wouldn't fit somehow in into the into this exhibit wouldn't fit. And you know, I, needless to say, we're encountering a lot of this in, in sort of the geopolitical um, situation we're in. Uh, a lot of these are showing their heads in very, very distinct ways. So everything that this exhibit covers is extremely germane to the current geopolitical situation. Okay, there's a little bit of adult learning theory behind why using exhibits is effective teaching practice. Um, um, well, you could, you could say creative or arts based, which you know I wrote the chapter on in the um, in the Traver Lesham anthology. But it really can be just switched to exhibit based approaches to challenging difficult content. And why exhibit based approaches in your classroom is effective teaching practice. First, it's as you saw, it's uh, immediately student centered and student directed. You want to make sure that students have a chance to lead in this process. Uh, certainly, it's experiential and increases engagement of students. And this goes back to sort of the original adult learning theorists. As I said, it appeals to uh, the diversity of student backgrounds um, in terms of its relevancy and, and, and context and creating a platform for critical thinking so that they can identify with what is happening um, in this, um, in the Nazi camp system. Um, collaboration is um, uh, uh, certainly encouraged in using this exhibit. Uh, we've had innumerable departments come in, the nursing department and accounting department, find ways to use the exhibit in their teaching. I think this one's important, this bullet point. It helps students comprehend and respond to challenging and, set and sensitive subject matter. The multimodal approaches, which I talked with, took you through, um, I think helps students absorb the serious nature and, and the shocking nature of the content of this exhibit. Uh, hearing from the survivors themselves, I think, is a way to sort of help students um, contextualized in a way that's uh, mean, not only meaningful, but um, um, is a safer way, you know? Um, and one of, maybe one of my favorites, it, this exhibit appeals to diverse and underprepared adult learners. Um, as I was saying, if, if text, if you're a freshman and you might be slightly academically underprepared for college and you've always been a visual learner, there's plenty for you. And just have the, having the text next to the image, next to the materials, next to the video can actually help um, our students uh, comprehend and absorb this, this very complex information. So there's in terms of multiple intelligences and one intelligence can help the other. This is called cognitive transference where a visual learner, when they're looking at the images, there's a caption in each of the images that that image is helping the student read better, um, to comprehend the material better in concert with one another so that a visual intelligence can help a text-based intelligence. I talked about student-directed and student-centered, um, uh, why that is effective for, uh, for students. And I'm not just making that up. This is Bloom's taxonomy of, of critical thinking. Creation is at the top of the critical thinking pyramid because when you create new and original work, you are asked, you must go through the bottom steps first. You must understand what you've read and experienced. You must remember something that's happened to you, apply it and analyze it and evaluate before you come to a point where you write a poem or author an essay or create a portfolio or make a film or a PowerPoint presentation. So a student centered where they create something or in the end of the exhibit um, to write a reflection and put it, write it on the blue card and leave it in the basket. That's like an intellectual gift for another student. I 
I talk, and if um, you want to know more about why exhibit-based teaching and arts-based teaching is really powerful, um, I wrote a chapter about it, and it goes into really just a lot more detail than I'm giving you right now. Um, uh, but that's in the uh, Traber Lesham anthology that Elsa mentioned um, humanistic pedagogy across the disciplines. Um, and this one thought that from my chapter um, about how it really takes a village to make this exhibit, to get it into your classroom, okay? So administrators and directors of the KHC, Laura Cohen, um, uh, it's up to you, it's up to your students and it's up to the community. Together, um, we make this happen as a unit and we, and we make this a priority to, to take difficult content, important content, that really relates to our modern world and, 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 um, and create a budget for it, to let, our, um, to let faculty be involved in the creation process of, of that teaching contents. And um, most importantly, as I said, look at the content in, in the KHC as, as really just a dynamic teaching tool. Okay, so we rely on our, um, our budgets and, um, and uh, priority from administration and faculty to um, increase buy-in and because this is effective teaching it's just the truth anyway i go into why using the exhibit in your teaching is effective um, in this chapter if you want to know more okay we're gonna we're now gonna we're entering the point where we're gonna start to pivot towards you and have a discussion a round table um, i just wanted to show some a few examples and then we'll show a film um, of student work and, and how um, instructors at, at QCC have used content and the exhibit um, in their teaching. In this case, um, um, a poetry professor had students write poems um, that reflect on Samuel Bach's paintings. A first year English student who interviewed a Holocaust survivor collaborated with art students who took port photographic portraits of those same survivors and put them together so that the portraits from the art students and the, and the biographical summaries from the first year English students were put on the walls of the KHC. This was about seven years ago for the NEH uh, year, art, artistic responses to genocide. I'm just trying to get your juices going. And I know you guys actually do a lot of this teaching. I'm, I'm so curious to hear how um, you go about using um, KHC um, content in this exhibit in your teaching. Here's that biographical summary I mentioned. Again, this is student-centered, student-directed work. It's experiential. Uh, They're leading their own learning. They are creating. And not only that, I think most importantly, the KHC is providing a conduit to actually showcase student work. Okay, these are the walls of the KHC. This was seven years ago. Um, Professor Warsi's ESL class, is there, he's always working with empathy. He, he used the exhibits of the KHC to sort of inspire his students to um, create PowerPoints about empathy. It's creation, okay? They're, they authored these. And it's a beautiful um, combination of text and image. I, I love using PowerPoint also. And we had a big event uh, where there was dance and um, spoken word and student art and students authored their own graphic novels, um, uh, the, which is um, Susan, uh, Susan Jacobowitz's students. This was a really wonderful, uh, everything I'm saying in one stop. Before we watch the film, I just wanted to alert you to some teaching resources and historical partners um, that um, have been involved in, in this exhibit. Obviously the KG has a slew of, of resources for you CEDL's been a big partner, and certainly through the Common Read and, and the NEH program, they they know exactly what we're doing, and they can help as well in terms of if you want to incorporate uh, one of the HIPs and um, uh, with uh, the exhibit, um, feel free to reach out to CEDL. Feel free to reach out to me if you ever want to brainstorm on a more personal level. Certainly the Common Read and NEH programming, the exhibit LibGuide, and uh, the librarian partners, which I mentioned. Um, Nicholas Waxman, who uh, has been aware of, uh, who really wrote 
uh, just a seminal book on the concentration camp system, uh, communicated with us throughout the curation process and offered his help. And we linked to his website on the on the KHC, uh, on this exhibit website. And obviously the USHMM, which has a ton of resources for both in terms of teaching and uh, re um, references. Okay. First, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna watch a film which with actual students talking about actual projects that they actually did using this exhibit. And then we're gonna have a discussion together. Um, I know that Laura is going to turn off the recording. For, so for those of you who are watching this um, in the recording format, uh, please come to the KHC to see this film, okay? We play it actually in the exhibit at the end across from the reflection wall, the student reflection wall, because we wanted to showcase the student projects to inspire uh, not only our students, but our instructors and our educators and our docents to see what's possible in terms of student response to this exhibit. So um, before we turn off the recording, um, I want to just encourage everybody to come to the KHC to uh, see this film of student work. It's extremely powerful. You know, that video, um, that amalgam of our wonderful student work, it makes me so proud to, um, to work with the KC. It makes me proud to teach at Queensboro. And it makes me, um, it makes me proud to uh, be able and lucky enough to, to teach such diverse students uh, who can identify with the content in this very powerful exhibit in so many different ways ways in which that I think it's incumbent, incumbent upon us to tap into. Um, I'd like to create another one of these videos in the next year or two as more and more classes use the exhibit in their teaching and more and more instructors find that this is really a, a peak teaching tool. And it's a peak teaching tool during these times. Um, so Ilsa, would you like to perhaps moderate the discussion let, let's have a 20-minute discussion, and we can um, actually brainstorm with one another. Maybe uh, the instructors and the docents in the room, you can share your experiences uh, using this exhibit or previous exhibits in your teaching, in your, in your pedagogy. Um, uh, and uh, for, the, for some who might be stuck, we can maybe brainstorm ways to get you unstuck and, and, and uh, give you suggestions for how you in your particular uh, subject and your courses can um, use the exhibit in ways in, in as dynamic a ways as we just saw from those student deliverables. I do wanna say that there is one key, I think, to engaging students um, not only just not only in the way I curated the exhibit, but um, when we do these student centered projects is that you create a forum that the students can showcase their work somewhere, somehow it can be in a, um, a blog or a, a little a book that you create um, a little print of the of your students writing or poetry or a portfolio of some kind that they can show their friends and family. Um, it really helps the students to see themselves and advance their learning and know it really builds their confidence actually as them as students. And so think about when you're creating uh, student-centered approaches to using this exhibit, think about ways where you can actually showcase those deliverables just like we did in this exhibit. Dr. Schrenemacher, would you maybe, would you care to um, moderate the forum? Sure, absolutely. I'd be happy to. Um, I invite everyone, if, you, if you'd like, to put questions in the chat or just um, unmute yourself and, and join right in a discussion. Hi, it's Laura. So you have the option, everyone has the option. If you also, at the bottom of your screen, you can put your comments in the chat or there's also a raise hand button and then we can um, unmute and we can unmute you and also turn your camera on. Uh, you know, feel free to reflect yourselves as, as an educator. You, you may not want to talk about your pedagogy, but, you, you know, it would, I think it would be nice if you actually, um, uh, or the projects that you have done or are thinking about doing it, and just reflect yourselves as instructors about 
how much or how little you've used uh, cultural centers or how you have tackled very challenging and difficult content or uh, methods that you've used, how you might think of adjusting or changing based on what we've seen today, you know, really just to get the discussion going. And it, it, you know, someone can actually just give their, you know, even their impressions about um, um, what they saw, especially about the, those, 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 the student work that we saw based on this exhibit. Carrie, I have a question while we're waiting for people to come in. Um, I know we have many um, people who have been docents with the center for a long time. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of the challenges that we sometimes encounter um, when some of our docents are longtime educators and also some are second generation survivors and how we try to accommodate, um, how do you give a tour to a group of people who may know nothing about the Holocaust um, with people, some people who have very personal experiences and how do we tease out factual uh, information versus the emotional component of this since it's such highly charged, highly charged history. Yeah, I suppose a docent tour can actually be a miniature version of all the sort of theory and practice that we talked about in terms of the curation of the exhibit and what we're hoping to do in terms of engaging students. It's, it's, it's never, you can never go wrong starting with the personal um, or sort of a rhetorical question at the beginning of a docent tour where you ask a student a sort of philosophical question or a personal question about um, that will actually put them in a headspace to then be, be more prepared to reflect about their own per personal experience with some of these themes and sub themes and then to put them in a, in a headspace where they will be better prepared to hear the enormity of the Nazi oppression that is about to uh, happen during the exhibit. I'm, I'm always um, one of the difficulty for instructors and, and whether they're uh, uh, just in general is relinquishing control of their classroom to students. Um, and, you know, when you've been teaching long enough, you start to get tired of your own voice a little bit and you actually want to hear what your students have to say more. So um, relinquishing control, whether it's during a docent um, tour or in the classroom to allow to, to be partners with your students as they go through this material, I think is really the best overarching way to sort of create engagement and uh, prepare them for the difficulty of the of the uh, content. Thank you. So I do have a, a question here. Um, you know, I've been as the associate director here at the KHC. I've been giving some tours at this point now of the new exhibit, and um, the student response has been really interesting. One question I had for you both as educators is how to navigate when particularly students, but community members, adults as well, come in with incorrect information about the Holocaust that they feel, you know, is fact just from things that they have heard and like how to navigate. It's like, it's so exciting when students give you something, right? They're like, oh, I heard this and I know this, but you don't want to shoot them down, obviously, but you want to encourage them to to learn more and to understand what they don't know. But how do you address something like that? This question was actually asked to me in Krakow um, at the Jewish Museum. I, I, I gave a talk there on American approaches to Holocaust education, and they have a really huge problem with what you're just talking about. There's, there's as, as bad as we have it here about misinformation and propaganda and, and anti-Semitic uh, information and websites out there, they, they really have a very, it's a bad situation. So I was meeting with Holocaust educators and they, everywhere they would, they would have students, like you're saying, coming with misinformation or deny or do Holocaust denial and things. And, um, you know, in the end, these are teachable moments, you know, in the moment that you have to meet with force, uh, you know, politely, but with force and, you know, people have the right to their own opinions, but they don't have the right to their own facts. And I think if you go at it with that attitude, um, you can use it as a moment of teaching to correct and to show, and to show, you know, so um, 
um, that kind of blew me away that we have this issue here in this country, but we don't have it nearly as bad as they have it in Europe in terms of um, getting to the truth, as you're saying, Marissa. So uh, I do not, I, I would encourage you not to shy away from these moments um, uh, or give credence to misinformation, but use them as a teachable moment to correct. And then if I could follow up with one more thing, uh, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the map, because I really feel like the, the original map in the exhibit is... Can you put a can you put a picture of the map up on the screen and maybe we can... we have this originally produced map and it takes up an entire wall and it is such an amazing teaching tool in so many ways just about you know just geography just understanding uh the map of Europe but to just see the breadth and the scope of the concentration camps it's it's unbelievable and one of the things as, as we're pulling it up um that I have talked about with anyone that I can is how the importance of the Ukraine and its placement on the map, obviously it's natural replacement. Oh, thank you. Yes, not, 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 you, not Ukraine's first rodeo, right? It comes, when you're standing in the physical exhibit, the map is at, that Ukraine is at eye level. And in the first tours that I did of the exhibit in the spring, well, it might be at your eye level, Marissa. <laughs> Maybe. That's, no, all right. no, Nor Norway is my eye level, Marissa. <laughs> um, the first tours that I did of the exhibit to classes was in the spring 2022 semester. And because of this, it was you know, right at the forefront for students and they recognized cities. Names like Kiev, they probably didn't know about before the war. And so that was really really a teachable moment for me to have a discussion about what it's like being here in the United States when there's war happening far from here and feeling helpless and um, not knowing what to do and comparing it with what Americans might have experienced when World War II was starting. Um, obviously, there's the new documentary by Ken Burns that's out right now that addresses this specifically. So the timing is actually really great. If educators wanted to assign excerpts of that film in their classrooms, uh, but could you just talk about this map and how you envisioned it as a tool? Yeah. So in researching the exhibit, there were many maps, obviously, of the camp system, the Nazi camp system. Um, some focused on just labor camps, some focused on just the transit camps, some just focused on ghettos, um, some uh, used the um, historically um, now outdated uh, borders, uh, you know, the borders in World War II are different than they are today. So the first choice was whether to use the World War II borders or to use modern borders to help students contextualize exactly what you're saying, um, because the, 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 the country borders and the regions were vastly different 80 years ago and 100 years ago. Um, so the, the first choice was to use a modern map and overlay the, um, it's a contemporary map, that shows the extent of Nazi German control during their apex in 1942. And then over that, make an amalgam of all the sort of visual information that all these dozens of other maps and try and make it one unit um, so that we have uh, where the ghettos, the ghettos have their own sort of um, color code. Um, uh, uh, extermination camps have their own color code. Yeah, thank you for going over this, this legend. Uh, uh, <coughs> labor camps, transit camps. We want, there was a map about the routes to the extermination camps and the railways that were used. We use that with these arrows that are ghosted over uh, the entire thing. So it, it's really the only map in existence that covers the types of camps, the transportation centers, and where victims were transported, depending on where they were, that overlays both ghettos and uh, the various types of camps and does so at the apex of German control in 1942. So it's a real one of a kind. It took a long time. And you have to also understand, as I mentioned, there were approximately 44,000 ghettos and camps in the Nazi concentration camp system. This map, although you can see so many, uh, each, each dot is a camp or a ghetto, okay? And, and there are 2,000 uh, points in this map which is only 7% of the total number of camps. That statistic alone, that if you're doing a docent tour just to show the scale and enormity of this 
and the horrificness of this Nazi camp system just to see the hundreds and hundreds of camps and ghettos in this map and to understand that only represents 7% of the total camps that were in existence. We could have put 44,000 um, plots on here, but the map would be entirely covered. That's how big this was. That's how big and complex and sinister this Nazi effort was. And to what you're saying, Marissa, I think this map communicates that um, just visually. And because it's eight and a half feet high and 20 feet wide, you can't help but just be um, absorbed by the enormity and complexity of what the Nazis did here in terms of incarceration. And also to build on that, because um, many of us are, are very aware of certain, you know, infamous sites like Auschwitz-Birkenau and Dachau and um, other sites that are in Poland. And if you start to look for those, especially the extermination camps, but also concentration camps, there are dozens for Auschwitz. There are dozens for Dachau. So there are many, there's a camp system within the total system that we show across the wall. And that's also significant to help people understand the sophistication of how the Nazis were using prisoners for forced labor, for internment, and for ex and ultimately exterminated. Yes, and so you can see those clusters uh, that Laura referred to. Those are the subcamps. So most major camps uh, uh, had dozens, if not hundreds of subcamps. And so you can clearly see that as these clusters around these major camps. Um, had we put in all 44,000 camps, you wouldn't have seen this uh, as clearly. Again, these are curatorial choices, but to me, um, just even showing the, the range of how far these victims came, you know, in Greece and the Balkans and in Italy, um, the, 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 the length they had to, get, to go to to be exterminated um, um, yeah, I love the map, you know, for all the reasons we talked about, just because uh, it, um, it combines text and image in such a powerful way. Um, but that 7% thing that uh, there are 2000 plots on this map, and it, and it doesn't even get to, it's not even 10% of the total camps and ghettos. We're also going to be in the next few months, trying to digitize this map so that when people come to the website, they'll be able to click on the uh, the left side and isolate, for example, Nazi territory or isolate ghettos or concentration camps. Elsa, you, one of your students, uh, your honor students was featured in that film. Uh, maybe to get the people's juices going a little bit here, can you talk about the process of uh, what happened with your student there and how did you get the ball rolling of starting to use the KHC in your teaching? And how, how did you get your, your student came up with such wonderful work? Uh, take us through the, the nexus and the process of how that works for somebody who hadn't used the KHC in their teaching, who now uses it. You're now uh, uh, the co-PI for this year's NEH program. That's how it happens, guys. You get addicted to the, this is a, you get addicted to using the KHC and then you can't stop. I, there hasn't been a semester where I haven't used the KHC. Maybe, Elsa, could you take us through like how how did that happen? Absolutely. Um, actually, the student benefited from um, a program that the KHC offered for me to learn more about how to use the um, the resources in my classroom. Um, and from that, I devised a unit um, using something that I learned there about safely in, safely out. And I asked for the students to um, in the unit in which we were. Um, visiting the exhibit virtually, because it was during the pandemic, um, to create and be inspired to create their own nonprofit agency. So they had to think about um, the, the, what they were hearing from the Holocaust survivors, what they were seeing visually in the maps and throughout the exhibit, again, accessing it through, um, through the web because we were in the pandemic, and then tap into their own um, ethos and what was important to them and their own core values. Um, and use that to sort of spark a creative process um, and then to write, uh, to create this nonprofit and to present it um, with a mission statement, um, tying it back into what they had learned and heard about through this, this wonderful um, and informative uh, concentration camp exhibit and then to write essays about it. Um, and so as you can see, the student, she really brought with it her experience um, prior to coming to the United States and then being in the United States um, and um, 
correlated that with what she was learning and experiencing um, as a QCC student involved with the exhibit. So thank you for that. Uh, we have a question here from Renata. Renata, do you want to? I see your hand is up. <clears throat> Um, yes, um, I just couldn't unmute myself for a moment. Um, I'm a professor at New York City College of Technology and I teach dental laboratory technology. So I'm not sure how I could incorporate um, this topic into my subject of teaching, but uh, from looking from perspective as a student, and uh, I was a student in Poland when I went to Auschwitz for the first time, um, I remember this made a tremendous impression on me. So up to now, I've been there four times, and including this September. And I have to say that in, uh, showing this information to young minds, it's incredible because this is when they soak in all the information and they actually develop um, a different thought process and empathy. And this is an incredible exhibit. And uh, showing the true reflection of what actually happened. And everywhere I visited in Poland, um, the museums, the concentration camps, and I went to, in September, I went to Auschwitz and to Grossrosen. and that was a new concentration I visited. I have to say it's, it's an incredible experience and I understand the students cannot experience it in person here, but having this exhibit and creating the memory and uh, preventing it from happening again it's it's ever so important. So I think this is a very important exhibit and very important learning tool for students, for young minds. Uh, they um, understand it differently and they can reflect differently as opposed to when they're older. So I want to thank you for this. And um, I want to uh, thank all the creators for that matter. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Renata. Um... And I really like that, uh, even though you're in a discipline that you think may not relate, uh, um, um, it's really encouraging to see you here and that um, this subject matter is important to you. I mean, just, I'm always wanting to try and fit, no matter what the discipline is, I'm always trying to think of ways in which that discipline can use the exhibit. Two quick things come to my head is, is from a forensic standpoint, from vict identifying victims. And I know they did an archeological dig in, at Treblinka to try and find where the uh, camps were uh, geographically located because there's they're forested now. And that was actually one of the more secretive camps. And so they had this big archeological dig, but one of the main ways that they were able to identify victims were through dental, because as you know, teeth um, um, last. Um, and then another thing just popped in my head and I don't, you know, but just, you know, the Nazis would extract gold from um, Jewish uh, victims uh, from their um, fillings. Um, but, um, you know, again, this is just me trying to find ways and angles for um, you to use the center. Certainly, it never hurts to, as a, as a, as a, as dental students, empathy is, <laughs> is, you know, because, uh, you know, going to the dentist is always a harrowing thing. Uh, building empathy in your in future dentists is certainly uh, would be another way i think that this could be a meaningful um thing for dental students to uh, examine and renata i just want to build on what carrie mentioned um we actually had two professors in the social sciences department at queensboro who are actually embarking on a course around medical ethics which absolutely does start with the testing and experimentation on uh concentration camp prisoners. And I've put in the chat um, a brand new center. It's called the Center for Medicine, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies. It's at Cedar sinai uh, Hospital in California, and I've included the link there. So there are many different ways. Um, you know, one of the, and this sounds very weird, but, you know, the camp system incorporates so many different aspects of inhumanity and humanity and sciences and so forth that um, you know, we'd also be very happy to talk with you offline uh, and to brainstorm different ways that you might be able to integrate this into your pedagogy and connect it to your students.
Uh, we have a question here from Jack, Jack Schwartz. I see your hand is raised if you'd like to share. Okay. Um, I, I know that the aim of this, by the way, has, has been beautifully uh, articulated, is for the classroom teacher. I've been out of the classroom for many years, but I am a, a docent uh, with, with the COVID. Of course, we've been absent for almost three years now, but I find it almost overwhelming to be able to take a group of students and in 45 minutes to an hour and a half, be able to convey this, this horrific, horrible era of our times. And what I, what I very often feel is that walking through the, uh, an exhibit like this absolutely demonstrates the, 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 the horridness of what happened. But it, it, I see there's an attempt in, in this exhibit to show the, the viewer how this came to be. But you know the, the question is, how do we get to the point of dehumanizing human beings to the point of extermination? To, to, uh, this is what I try to, I, I would try to at least get across to a group of people who come to a museum for just a, an hour or two. And the thing I want them to walk away with is the understanding of how this, how this can possibly happen. It's, it's, a, it's, it's beyond my comprehension, but I know it can happen. And it did happen and, and it will happen again if we're not careful. You know, it sounds to me like you, you just created maybe one of the best reflection prompts I've ever heard. And that so at the end of the tour, that I would that that question you just posed should be posed to students. Um, the second thought I had, and, and I'll let others respond to this, is that um, it's, it's as a docent, I think it's super important to work with your instructor to see what they've read before prior to coming in, what themes they're working on. I showed some sub themes that an instructor might be working on. So as a docent, I think customizing in a tour, because you're right, Jack, I mean, you're just not gonna be able to cover it all, especially just because of the immensity of it. Although I love your question posed in the form of a reflection for students to actually try and wrap their head around as a, uh, for, the, for a response prompt. Uh, but uh, um, working, working with instructors who some may have had more reading prior to the visit and or more exposure to, in terms of introduction of the Holocaust, or they might be reading texts that will give them a little a head start. Um, working with, uh, and this is something that the KHC does really well in terms of um, uh, accessing what it is these uh, instructors are teaching, uh, getting their syllabus, understanding what they want to get out of it so that docents can actually make this digestible in their hour or for however long it is. You know, I'm glad you brought this up, Jack. Also, if I could just add in, um, uh, Marissa and I are working on an outline for all of the docents uh, and key points. And one of the things that we've noticed even amongst ourselves, for example, when we've had different elected officials coming is that very quickly the tour becomes anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And so we also need to time ourselves. So that's going to be something that we focus on. And I think the bigger thing that we're, we're heading toward is less about communicating every single detail. It's impossible. It is simply impossible and it is overwhelming, but is to really bring them into the space and explain how the exhibition is organized. And then we think then to let sort of people kind of move around and take it in on their own. Uh, and that might be another way to also encourage them to come back and do additional research. So we're not expecting anyone to certainly go through the entirety of the, of, of the tour. And just to thank um, one of the professors at Queensboro, Alison Semino, um, who's thanking us. And we're so grateful, Alison, for your, your feedback and organizing. She says it's a great resource. And she's always had her classes visit the KHC and that students have been enriched by their experience. And we're just really, really grateful for all the collaboration and support we get from faculty members and community members at the KHC and QCC.
Well, it's been uh, 90 minutes since we've started. Um, just personally, just thank you for your uh, support. Thank you for joining us. Um, Elsa, do you, do you have closing? Or Laura, do you want to close? Elsa, I'll pass it to you first. Uh, well, just to, to thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Lane, for uh, sharing this journey of putting the exhibit together and also informing us of and sharing with us innovative ways to integrate the, the, um, the exhibit into our curriculum. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ilsa, and thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Marissa, and thank you to everyone who participated today. It's a really significant exhibition for the camps and uh, for the KHC. And we're really, really grateful, Carrie, for all the work and love and support that you've given the KHC over you know, the past many years. And you know, this exhibition really speaks to not only your dedication, but your vision for bringing this really intense subject matter to life and making sure that at every step of the way, it's not only multimedia in focus, but it's always thinking about how our students relating to this, how our students participating in this, and how can we make this kind of contact completely relevant to our communities, especially at a time when the Holocaust uh, is the history of it is not only being distorted, but denied. And at the same time, you know, uh, we were speaking with a colleague recently who talked about the Holocaust being really a 20th century story and a 20th century history. And how do we make you know, not comparisons, but how do we make connections to genocides and mass atrocities that are happening not only in the United States and have happened here, but also elsewhere. So thank you everyone for attending. The recording of this will be up on our website very soon. We hope you stay safe and well. Be well. <laughs>